We're all familiar with these horrific images in Goya's 2nd and 3rd of May paintings, where Napoleon's troops battled with the citizens of Madrid, resulting in the slaughter of the citizens. They remind us of something we're all aware of, that violence and destruction are an important part of being human, maybe even part of our heritage. But what we're going to ask today is, is that part of our nature? We have this basic assumption that humans were created to be violent and compete over sex. Whether we're talking about human evolution or the original sin, when it comes to human nature, the outcome is the same. Something stinks at our core. It's all about sex and violence. In our society, we have these sort of basic urges, at least many of us do. This basic notion that deep down inside, it's the urge to sex and violence that drives us along, that it's the capacity for aggression and destruction has led us to success over other species and even over ourselves. We have this notion that might makes right, survival the fittest, biggest, baddest, meanest. Is that true? Are humans naturally aggressive at our core? Are humans really aggressive, violent, and selfishly combative? Actually, no. I'm going to show you today that it's not all about sex and violence. Rather, the key to human evolutionary success and to doing what we do in the world is all about cooperation and getting along. Think about it for a moment. Here's a headline that we wouldn't even bat an eye at, right? Four killed in New York City. We almost expect it. But here's a headline that we're never going to see. <laughs> but it happens much, much, much more commonly. Think about this. We all know that competition and cooperation are core parts of being human. But what we forget is that cooperation is much more common. Violence is part of our capacity, but is not inherent in humanity. It turns out we're wired to be social. Cooperating, getting along, working together is what we do best. OK, but this, this sort of goes against common sense, right? I mean, we know deep down inside of us is this sort of violent beast waiting to break out. For every Dr. Jekyll, there's a Mr. Hyde. Right? And as the philosopher Thomas Hobbes told us, it's really only the control exerted by society and institutions that keeps the inner beast at bay, right? Wrong. It's not all about sex and violence. It's not even mostly about sex and violence. It's really about our amazing capacity to cooperate and get along. OK, well, how do we know this? How do we know this? We know this from substantial research in the biological and social sciences. So get ready, because we're going to head into a couple facts about our minds and our bodies and their evolution that support this assertion. Let's take aggression. Right? We know that uh, aggression underlies violence. You need aggression to be violent. But what is aggression? Is it a single thing? That leads us to fact number one. Aggression is not a uniform or consistent discrete trait. If aggression is not one thing, then it couldn't have been the target of human evolution. I mean, when we say aggression, what do we mean? We have reactive aggression when we react, proactive aggression when we plan it, maternal aggression when mom defends her young, territorial aggression, predatory aggression, uh, irritable aggression, sex-related aggression, intermale aggression. I think you get the point. Aggression is a constellation of behaviors, not a single thing that we do. If it's not a single thing, it could not have been the target of evolution in creating a human nature. OK, well, let, let's go with that. But but you could say, well, um, what about where aggression and violence come from? Maybe that's the answer. So where does aggression and violence come from? Most of us think that there's this sort of biological root for aggression, right? Here's fact number two. The nature of human aggression is not in our genes. There are no systems in our bodies for aggression. You might think, well, wait a minute. I've heard about a gene. Yeah, some people have even argued there's a gene for aggression. Recently, they focus on this gene. It's called monoamine oxidase A, M-A-O-A. -A. Maybe you've heard of it. Some call it the warrior gene. The warrior gene story goes something like this. If you happen to have one version, the warrior version of this gene, uh, the bearer of that gene is a little bit unstable, a little bit less predictable, much more aggressive, much better in conflict and competition. If that's true, OK, if this does work out, then maybe I'm wrong. Maybe humans are naturally aggressive, or at least genetically so. So recently, I was a consultant on a National Geographic special that actually asked some questions about this gene. They followed host Henry Rollins. Henry's a, uh, a poet, spoken, art, uh, spoken word artist, former frontman for a punk rock group called Black Flag, and generally an angry guy. They followed Henry around as he 
tried to figure out where does aggression and violence come from, both in him and in others. So he went out and interviewed uh, a bunch of fairly aggressive people, ultimate fighters, gang members, bikers, and a couple more sort of meditative, peaceful people, uh, like uh, Buddhist monks and a few others. And then they tested us. National Geographic tested all of the interviewers, all of us consultants, to see which version of the gene we had. Well, here is a picture of Henry and I. <laughs> Looking at this, I, we all know who has the warrior gene and who does not. <laughs> and we are wrong. Not Henry, not the ultimate fighters, not the bikers, not the gang members. It was me and two of the Buddhist monks who had the warrior gene. <laughs> So I think they're going to have to retitle it the sort of, you know, happy academic and meditation gene, but I don't think that's going to sell. <laughs> the point of giving you this example is to drive home that you can look at our entire genome. You can look at our brain, our hormone systems, our guts, our bones, our blood. You're not going to find a single system that is uniquely for aggression. Okay? Aggression is an amazing capacity humans have, but it is not inherent in us. We can do aggression. We can make our bodies be aggressive but it is not who we are at our core. That leads us to fact number three. Peaceful and cooperative interactions make up the vast, vast majority of what we do day in and day out throughout our entire evolutionary history right up to this morning. To understand how we come to this conclusion, although you guys already know it because you are human, but how we come to this conclusion in the broad sense is by asking evolutionary questions. So one first place we can go is to look at the other primates, right? Humans are primates. If all the primates share this inherent violent aspect, then we could expect humans share that as well. And here's how we usually see the other primates, right? It's a, it's a big male macaque with fangs, you know, buff and about to get into a fight and be aggressive. If all the humans and the primates share this core of violence, then we're probably violent, right? The only problem is if you go out and spend a lot of time with other primates, this is what you see. This is what they spend the vast majority of their time and effort doing, getting along and hanging out together. OK, so no evidence for inherent violence here. But what about our evolution? We've got two million years of really good knowledge about what has happened to humans and our specific lineage. If you look at the fossils in the archaeological record, you see that over the last two million years, there are very, very, very few examples of evidence of a human killing or aggressing towards another human in a serious way. Of course there were fights, but not much evidence of death at humans' hands, and almost no evidence of organized violence or warfare for the majority of those two million years. About 10 to 20,000 years ago, we start to see a big change. 10 to 20,000 years ago, we start to see more examples of human-on-human -human violence and even organized violence in warfare. But in that last 10 to 20,000 years, our brains and DNA have changed very, very, very little. What's changed is the way we structure the world and our societies. That's what's led to the change in humans. It turns out it is not all about sex and violence. So the story of human evolution is how we get from something that can make some really cool stone tools two million years ago to something that can paint these amazing images on cave walls 40,000 years ago to the creators of New York City and Pinot Noir today. And let me tell you, the answer is not all about sex and violence. The answer is an incredible story of how humans have worked together, cooperated, and collaborated. Think about it. Our human ancestors in the past had to get together to control and create fire. They had to make more and more complex stone tools. They had to avoid being eaten by all the things out there. And think about this for a second. Over the last couple million years, we don't have horns or fangs. We're not particularly big. We can't run very fast. We can't wrestle large animals. We can't even fly. All we have are our big brains and each other. And that's what we've been using throughout our entire evolutionary history. That's how we've got to where we are. So, that ability to cooperate and collaborate has allowed us to do even more amazing things than anything else. The way we parent, the way we raise our young and teach each other is a distinctive pattern of cooperation, another way that we have made it in the world. So think about where we are today. Think about all the things that have evolved 
over time and emerged during our two million years of evolution, and whether or not they required complex or extreme cooperation. Let's think about that. Fire, cooperation, right? Hunting large game, cooperation. Building complex tools, cooperation. Right? Caring for sick and elderly and extended families, cooperation. Agriculture, cooperation. Domestication of animals, cooperation. Villages, cities, towns, cooperation. Cooperation, cooperation. Language. Cooperation. Exactly. Even the ultimate form of violence, the most extreme violence there is, warfare, requires extreme cooperation. The better cooperators win wars. So the story of human evolution is not all or even mostly about sex and violence. Yeah, bad things happen. Yes, sex and violence can be important, but it is not inherent in humanity. It is one of our capabilities. So here's the punchline. Human nature is all about cooperation and getting along. Sometimes that involves sex and violence, but most of the time it does not. So at this point you might be saying, okay, well, what am I supposed to do with this information? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take it out into the world. When the media or your friends or even your family tell you, well, you just got to sit back and take it because humans by nature are bestial and mean. Oppression, inequality, abuse, selfishness, well, they're just going to happen because that's being human. You can say, no, you're wrong. Those are all potentials, not absolutes. The true story of human evolution sits in our amazing ability to get along and cooperate. All right. Well, I'm an academic, and uh, you know I like homework, so I'm giving you a homework assignment. Here's the homework assignment for the rest of your life. Ready? Go out there and be human. Cooperate. Collaborate. Get along, make a difference. It is, after all, what we do best. Thank you.